Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Science for Citrus Health Spring Webinar Series, organized by Dr. Monique Rivera and Dr. Peggy Lamo. I'm Stephanie Pereira with the UC Statewide IPM program. Peter Cosina is also here with us to help run the poll questions and troubleshoot any technical problems. Please also note that this webinar is designed for growers and agricultural pest management professionals. Master gardeners can certainly benefit from participating, but the pest management pr methods presented, especially the pesticides, are not to be followed without a clear understanding of their legal use in home environments. Okay, um, so now I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today. Dr. Michelle Heck is a research molecular biologist at the United States Department of Agriculture. Today, she will be speaking about a therapeutic molecule evaluation and field delivery pipeline for solutions to HLB. And now I'd like to pass the mic over to Dr. Heck. You can go ahead and share your slides. Okay, thank you all for the introduction and for tuning in this afternoon or this morning for those of you in California. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how the USDA Agricultural Research Service, my lab and my research team has been approaching research on citrus screening disease. The USDA ARS is the research arm of the agency. A crucial part of our mission is to conduct research to develop and transfer solutions to agricultural problems of high national priority. Here you can see the organizational chart of the USDA ARS. Research is coordinated and conducted by scientists within specific geographic areas. You can see there in the green box uh, with guidance from the Office of National Programs and assistance from the Office of Technology Transfer. For example, I am in the Northeast area based in Ithaca, New York, and the epicenter for citrus screening disease in the agency is in the Southeast area. Scientists in these different geographical areas are typically restricted on the types of crops, pests, and diseases they can work on to some degree. These restrictions are largely defined by regional crop, pest, and production issues and congressional funding. Newer initiatives in the agency are now breaking down these silos because the complexity of agriculture's toughest problems demand national research and expertise coordination. Citrus greening is one of these problems. As you know, it is the most serious disease of citrus and found in all citrus growing regions of the world. The bacterial pathogen and insect vector do not respect borders and readily travel along trade and travel routes. In response to the crisis, ARS has developed a program called the Grand Challenges, and the citrus greening problem became one of the first grand challenges for ARS scientists. The Grand Challenge is a new paradigm for ARS research from the Office of National Programs. It would be the first of several new changes in how the agency works on these intractable plant disease problems. The Grand Challenge transcends national, traditional ARS area and commodity boundaries. It allows for access to scientists' expertise in other areas to rapidly advance research and to leverage discoveries that may have been made in other systems. The grand challenge is focused on identifying pathways or bright spots as we call them to move research to deliverable products. In ARS, the Citrus Greening Grand Challenge has had two champions working together. Dr. Bob Shatters, who's a research leader a molecular biologist at the uh, USDA ARS in Fort Pierce, and Dr. Kevin Hackett, who's a national program leader for crop protection. So let's talk more about these bright spots. In the grand challenge framework, we organized into teams focused on different aspects of citrus screening research. These include some topics that you may have heard about in your discussions, like early detection, uh, early detection and monitoring for the insect vector and the disease, novel interdiction molecules, and cross-protecting microbes, which you'll hear about a little bit later in Dr. Bonding's presentation. As teams of researchers worked in these spaces, we sought interactions across the teams to find ways to link these strategies together. The points where different strategies come together to function in a way that is more effective than the individual part is called the bright spots. When we find a bright spot, we work hard to bring additional resources and manpower to help it take off. Last year, ARS launched the ARS X program, modeled after the X Prize. This exciting program enabled us to compete for prize money to take one of the Grand Challenge bright spots to the next level. Winning the ARS X Prize then enabled us to compete for an even larger grant. Our new grant is a large coordinated agricultural product from the USDA funding agency NEFA, or the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. 
The new grant is currently the framework driving the most cutting edge eco-friendly research in the IRS on solving citrus screening disease. Our new NEPA project is called Therapeutic Molecule Evaluation and Field Delivery Pipeline for Solutions to Citrus Screening. We have around 79 team members organized into teams, and we are still adhering to that bright spot concept to drive this research forward. There are five locations in the IRS involved in the project, even including my lab in Ithaca, New York, and for example, Rodney Cooper's lab in Washington State, labs which are obviously not in citrus growing regions of the country. We partner with other academic institutions and private industry partners, AgriSource, a small agribusiness in Florida, and the synthetic biology company Codec DNA, led by Dr. Dan Gibson. The goal of this project captures the framework from the grand challenge. We developed and are implementing a pipeline from therapeutic molecule evaluation to field delivery of these molecules into citrus trees, working across the agency and with numerous partners to remain solution driven. So, we are spread across five states, have two uh, research groves for field trials, including groves with commercial growers in different growing regions around the state of Florida. For the remainder of my talk, I'm going to summarize some of the bright spots we have been focusing on in this NEPA project, as well as some of the others. One important area of research is in the discovery of novel therapeutics. We want to ensure that the solutions to citrus greening are based on multiple control points, such as killing the bacteria, boosting plant immunity, and killing the vector. This helps to avoid resistance developing to any one approach. We are also looking to improve the economics of delivery. Some of the most promising strategies are still too expensive to roll out on a large scale. We are also investigating some new therapies, such as nanobodies, which are like tiny antibodies, RNA aptamers and antimicrobial peptides, which I will tell you about on the next couple of slides. Over the past few years, my lab has been focused on the development of RNA aptamers that block the feeding structures produced by the Asian citrus psyllid. RNA aptamers are small pieces of RNA that bind to different targets and block their function because the aptamer shape disrupts the, the function of the target molecule. This is an image of the Asian citrus psyllid. And you can see here in this electron micrograph, this feeding structure that's produced by the psyllid. This feeding structure is called a stylet and it is used to pierce the plant. Um, and, and it's actually this, um, this mouth part that delivers CLAS into the citrus phloem, which ends up causing citrus greening disease. Artificial diet experiments let us more easily visualize these feeding structures and develop molecules like RNA aptamers that inhibit feeding. When the psyllid feeds on a plant or on an artificial diet, it deposits a protective coating called the sheath. The sheath is essential for the psyllid to establish this feeding site on the tree. Shown here on the resulting effects of one such aptamer. The bottom image shows what the stylet sheath looks like in the artificial diet. The top shows what is happening when an inhibitory RNA aptamer blocks the sheath from forming. You can see that um, the, the stylets are, are not elongated or properly forming, and you see these sort of just a few small, um, small patches of blue where the psyllid has, um, has attempted to feed. We are now working on ways to deliver the sheath blocking RNA aptamer into citrus trees. A second area of research, which was kickstarted by funding from the California Citrus Research Board, is based on the discovery of plant-based antimicrobial peptides. Plants and bacteria coexist in nature, often in a beneficial relationship, such as the example shown here between legumes and Cynorhizorbia. Cynorhizorbium metalloti is a soil-dwelling bacteria that forms a partnership with the roots of legumes to help the plant with nitrogen utilization. As a part of this process, the plant encodes small peptides called NCR peptides, which limit the growth of the bacteria in the root structures so that the ideal balance between bacterial cells and plant cells can be achieved. These plant encoded NCR peptides have been shown to effectively inhibit human and other animal bacterial pathogens. We screen the genome of the plant Metacago truncatula for NCR peptides and have been testing these against the culturable surrogate of citrus greening bacterium, Liberbacter crescens. We've identified around 15 peptides that inhibit Liberbacter growth. The pink area on the graph shows bacterial growth over time when no peptides are added. The teal area shows 
uh, the bacterial growth over time in the presence of those active NCR peptides. We are now testing these 15 NCR peptides for efficacy in citrus trees using different delivery strategies I'll describe in just a few minutes. A third group of molecules my lab is focused on is called insect neuropeptides. Like humans and other animals, insects have a complex immune system and nervous system that is regulated by small protein molecules called neuropeptides. My lab used a technology called proteomics to characterize the collection of small pep peptides produced by the Asian citrus psyllid, which is the vector of citrus greening disease. In collaboration with Dr. Ron Nackman, a USDA ARS chemist who is an expert in neuropeptide synthesis, we are testing whether these different neuropeptide mimics can kill these citri or block transmission of the citrus greening bacterium. This project is funded by the HLB MAC program as a part of APHIS. What you can see here in these tubes are small detached leaves, and these are the, the format in which we're rapidly screening for peptides that are lethal to the psyllid or that block transmission. Another part of our project is to develop a standardized screening pipeline that can be used by our team and other members of the scientific community so we can compare new therapies to the existing ones and test which ones might work better in combination. For example, how effective are the NCR peptides as compared to other peptides that have already been characterized? We have a pipeline that starts with small lab-based assays and goes all the way to field testing for molecules that work in the lab-based assays and greenhouse-based assays. We have funding to test approximately 1,500 molecules from the scientific community in a way that protects the intellectual property of the molecules for the participating investigators. So if you know of any researcher or research team that may have something, a chemical compound or a lead that, that you would like them to test in our pipeline, please have them get in touch with me. A major focus of research in the ARS right now on citrus greening as part of this new NEPA project is focused on delivery strategies. So what do I mean by a delivery strategy? Well, this involves asking the question, how do we deliver these therapies into existing trees to cure them of citrus greening? And how can we use therapies to protect trees that may not yet have been infected? Our team is advancing research on three delivery strategies. These are one, a novel delivery strategy, two, a direct plant infusion, three, transgenic plants. Growers need delivery options to maximize their ability to manage the disease in the field. Some delivery strategies may be better for certain types of therapies. In the following slides, I will show you some results using these delivery strategies to deliver an antimicrobial peptide, we call peptide one, that kills the citrus screening bacterium. This peptide is not an NCR peptide, but belongs to a different class of antimicrobial peptides. ARS scientists in my lab and at the USDA in Fort Pierce, in collaboration with AgriSource, developed a novel delivery strategy to treat plants infected with citrus greening that is showing promise in greenhouse trials. On the right, you see a picture of a plant showing classical symptoms of greening, called blotchy model, where the leaves are yellowing. On the left is a plant treated with peptide one, using the new delivery strategy. The new plant growth is symptom-free, no signs of blotchy model. This strategy can be used to treat existing infected trees in the field and reduces exposure of the treatment to non-target organisms in the environment. This strategy is versatile and could also be used to rapidly deliver any of the therapeutic molecules I described earlier, as well as others you may have heard of in the community. For example, Dr. Hyling Jin's finger lime antimicrobial peptide or the insect toxins that Dr. Bonding will talk to you about in her presentation shortly. The next method is called direct plant infusion. This work is being pioneered by Dr. Bob Shatters and collaborators at AgriSource. In this method, we hook up a 3D printed device onto the plant for delivery molecules directly into the plant vascular tissue. This method allows us to target therapies directly into the vascular tissue. Here you see a fluorescent dye moving through the plant that was delivered uh, using this strategy. This strategy is particularly important because the vascular tissue is where the citrus screening bacterium live within the citrus tree. This strategy is showing promise in greenhouse trials. The graph shows the reduction in bacterial DNA in trees over time, reaching high levels of reduction, indicating that the plant is clearing the bacterium from the tissues. The infected plants shown on the bottom receiving the treatment with peptide one look nice and healthy as compared to the infected plants getting a control treatment on the top which are showing the classic citrus screening symptoms of blotchy model. 
Dr. Ed Stover at Four Peers is coordinating the transgenic plant production. Transgenic plant production is not going to help the citrus industry right now, but in the long term, this may be the most cost effective way to grow citrus. Transgenic citrus trees expressing peptide 1 show high levels of psyllid mortality. This is because peptide 1 also kills the bacterial symbionts inside the psyllid, in addition to the citrus greening bacterium, a two for one, controlling the bacterium and the insect vector via that bacterial population that lives within the psyllid. In parallel with the science, we are also working with AgriSource to conduct economic and regulatory assessments to identify pathways to commercialization of these methods. Additionally, we are working with extension educators and science educators to train growers and the next generation of students in the use and safety of these technologies. To conclude, we expect to continue following the science with the development and testing of new therapeutics for citrus screening. We're advancing research on different delivery strategies to get these therapeutics into citrus trees. We are working on understanding the economic and regulatory viability of each of these therapies and approaches. We are also training the next generation of students in these new technologies and how to conduct interdisciplinary research within the Grand Challenge framework. So finally, ARS scientists are also doing basic research. We need to do this basic research to understand what's happening with citrus screening disease at the molecular level. This type of research will pave the way for novel delivery, uh, novel ways to block transmission of the citrus screening bacterium. Work in my lab is focused on identifying the psyllid genes that regulate transmission of the psyllid, uh, citrus screening bacterium. Interestingly, not all psyllid populations transmit the bacterium equally well. This graph shows the transmission rate on the y-axis of 15 different psyllid populations collected in Florida along the x-axis. Please keep in mind, these are all the same species of psyllid, just different populations. Some psyllid populations like you see here, L8 and H2-1 transmit very well. And other populations like L16 and OS3 do not transmit at all. These differences in transmission allows us to use genomics and other methods to identify the psyllid genes and pathways involved in the transmission process. This work may reveal novel ways to control the citrus screening bacterium by blocking psyllid transmission of the bacterium from tree to tree. Key to advancing this research is the recent Asian Citrus Psyllid Genome Sequencing Project, which was part of an earlier NEFA funded award to my team and a significant advance for the field. So with that, I conclude my section and open the floor to questions or discussion or turn it over to the next speaker. Okay, so we do have some questions. Are whole plant direct infusion technologies being evaluated for impact on yields? Yes, uh, and in fact, those experiments are currently part of the, the research that is being funded by this grant. Okay, um, Donald has asked, on the plants that have improved in color, has the fruit improved as well? It's too soon to say. These experiments are just a few months old at this point. But that's a great question. Okay. And then one of our attendees has also asked, how do you assess the effect of peptide one on beneficial insects? That's a great question. So um, our partners at AgriSource are involved in handling the, um, the research that would involve addressing regulatory concerns such as off-target effects on beneficials. Um, I would say that the, the new delivery strategy in theory, if it works as, as we expect it to work, um, will help to minimize those off-target effects. Um, so, you know, that, that's research that will be done in the, you know, in the scope of the pipeline. And so, so once we have molecules that have made it to the stage of field trials, then AgriSource will be doing the the evaluations for, um, you know, environmentally, uh, environmental concerns. Great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mich uh, Michelle, for, for your content. That was very, that was very enlightening. Um, okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Bryce Falk. Dr. Falk is a professor in the Department of Plant Pathology at UC Davis. Today, he will be speaking about viruses of Asian citrus psyllid and approaches to using those viruses as a pest management tool. Dr. Falk, you can go ahead and share your slides. Okay, 
Good morning, everyone, and, or afternoon. And uh, thank you for asking me to talk about some of the work from our lab. So I'm going to talk <clears throat> uh, about the work that we're doing with psyllid viruses. And these are most of the people who've done the work and deserve all the credit. So I wanna introduce viruses first, because when we think of viruses, we think of bad things. And we think of viruses that cause important diseases in humans. Here's polio, smallpox, HIV, Ebola. And we also think of uh, serious plant diseases that can be caused by many different viruses. And then this is a very serious plant disease right now in Africa called cassava brown streak. And it's actually caused by two viruses uh, that separately can cause a disease or they can doubly infect plants. They're both transmitted by this insect called the uh, Amicia tabaceae, this little white fly here. And actually there's very good progress in, in transgenic resistance for this. Um, and of course, everyone knows about this virus and we hope this one will go away. And I got vaccinated and I hope you do too. But most viruses <clears throat> are not pathogens. They're common components of what we call the microbiome. You're full of viruses, I'm full of viruses, plants, insects, they're all full of viruses. Uh, the viruses that we really know about, we've discovered them because of their association with specific diseases. But most viruses don't cause diseases. And most viruses actually remain to be discovered. And our intent and our research is focused at can we use them as beneficial microbes? So this is just an example of how many viruses there are in our planet. They're the most abundant microbes in our planet. It's estimated that there's 10 virus particles for every cell. Uh, the word pathogen is not part of the, of the word virus or of the definition of a virus. <clears throat> and if you were to line up just bacteriophages, uh, they would end to end, it would uh, be more than 200 million light years. So there's a lot of viruses out there. So instead of thinking of viruses as something bad, um, we're trying to turn this around and see if we can do research that will allow us to use viruses for something good. So can we use insect and or plant viruses to target uh, plant diseases or plant pests. And we've worked with a few different ones and I'm going to talk mostly about our work, of course, with HLB here. Uh, and two of the strategies or conceptual approaches that we could consider would be uh, competition, microbiome manipulation, or even biological control of a specific target. Uh, but also, can we use viruses and genetically modify them to use them to target specific genes uh, in plants or insects, in this case, diaphragma citri, uh, if we knew which genes to target. So we know about this. Uh, Dr. Heck just gave a very good talk about aspects of this. So we know that the bacteria are transmitted by uh, diaphragma citri, the Asian citrus psyllid, and the disease can be very severe. Uh, but when we started our work, there were no viruses that infect E. citri. There were none known. Now, if I'm right, and I said, well, viruses are the most abundant microbes on the planet, and every organism has viruses, including some viruses have viruses, then there have to be viruses in E. citri. And so we work in our lab with collaborators from around the world. Uh, the collaborators were, we could not have done the work without them. They collected D. citri from different worldwide populations and many places in the United States. Uh, we either imported RNA or we imported psyllids that were dead but were preserved specifically so we could isolate their RNA. And then we took a modern approach to just uh, unbiased look for virus in, in these different decitri populations. And we learned a lot and we found a lot of viruses. <clears throat> so this slide shows some of the different types of viruses that we found 
and it shows some of the places that we found them. So for example, here's a virus, its particle looks like this. Um, and we found this virus in diaphragm citri from China, Taiwan, Florida, Texas, and Hawaii. Uh, we found uh, this virus here from China, Florida, and Hawaii. Uh, here's a virus that we found from Pakistan, Brazil, and Uruguay. So what we found is that different psyllid populations had different viruses um, and some of the different viruses occurred in specific different locations. So we would like to work with these viruses and diaphragma citri. And because California, of course, is a citrus producing state, we have to think about how we can do this safely and not uh, release these things. So we're very lucky at UC Davis, we have a Biosafety 3 level 3P contained research facility. So this facility, it's actually enclosed, uh, the land is all enclosed in a locked gate that requires a special key card to get into. And then you have to have a key card to get in this door. And once you enter here, you have to have a key that lets you in another door. And there you have to take off all your clothes, go through a locked door and change into uh, work, uh, disposable work clothes. And when you come out, you have to shower. So in this facility, we have greenhouses, growth chambers, and we can work with uh, pests and pathogens that are threats to California and US agriculture. Uh, this facility is under negative pressure. When you open the door, air gets sucked in. So things don't get out easily. And you, you can't bring out anything alive except for humans. So within that facility, uh, we have a lot of different things going on with uh, diaphragma citri, but also some other pests and pathogens. Uh, we're able to maintain decitri in these uh, cages on small citrus plants, uh, and we're able to do uh, transmission assays for seed loss and, and ultimately keep plants to look for HLB. So what we have in this facility right now <clears throat> For our lab, what we're working with is we have four different populations of diaphragma citri that we've collected with colleagues from California, Hawaii, Uruguay, and Taiwan. And these superscript letters here indicate that these are slightly genetically different. They're actually different, uh, different lineages of psyllids. We know that we've sequenced the genomes and prokaryotes for all of these. So we know what we've got here. We also have these viruses going. So these are just five of the ones that we've discovered. Five is plenty uh, for us right now. All of these viruses are not pathogenic to, to D. citri. They can infect D. citri. Uh, we see no effects on them. Some of them can replicate to very high levels in the D. citri, but we don't see any negative effects. They're natural components of the D. citri microbiome. Now, we know that our psyllid populations and our virus populations, there, there's specificity there. For example, this virus <clears throat> we know can, can infect all of our psyllid populations. I don't show this one, but we know this one is susceptible. This virus, so far, we've only been able to infect our California population. We suspect this one can go more. This one is very interesting because this one this virus can only infect the Uruguay and Taiwan citri, And we know that these are actually a different lineage. And we know that these have resistance to this virus. And we've studied that because we're interested in fundamental uh, molecular virus host interactions. And this is, so this is very interesting. But the point here is just like what uh, Dr. Heck was saying, not all psyllids are equal and not all viruses are equal. And we've really got to, to look at this, at the big picture. Now, one of the things we're interested in is what are all these viruses doing? We know uh, we don't see pathogenic effects, but we know from the literature, the scientific literature, that there are interactions between uh, microbial components in insect vectors. So our question is, could some of our viruses be indirectly affecting they're interacting with sea loss and affect the ability of sea loss transmission. 
Now we have these data here, which are beautiful and wonderful and so exciting, uh, but <laughs> probably not what we hoped. Uh, so this is one of our viruses. And we found this virus originally uh, in Hawaiian psyllids. And the Hawaii, they have had D. citri for a long time, but they don't have HLB. And what this 100% means is all, all of the insects we've tested have this virus. Now in Florida, where they, and this is work from Oscar Batuman's lab here, um, in Florida, where of course they do have D. citri, this particular virus is extremely rare. Um, so this doesn't mean anything, of course, uh, but the correlation is very interesting. And we've worked with this virus. Uh, we've been able to manipulate it. We know its genome. Uh, we know where it reproduces and what it does. We know how it's spread. It's an interesting virus because it's really spread um, just transovarially, meaning infected females, they lay eggs. 100% of the progeny have the virus. So we've looked at, we were hoping, of course, that this virus would have a negative effect on sea loss. Um, and we don't, we don't see that. Um, here, what we've looked at <clears throat> is the amount of virus in psyllids. And this is a qPCR data. So the higher the, the figure here, the more DNA that we are or RNA from the virus that we see. And so these are in psyllids that uh, just have the virus. And here's in psyllids that have sea loss plus the virus. And actually what we have seen is that the virus or the sea loss seems to have an effect on the virus that we do seem to get more virus in these co-infections. But of course, what we hoped is we don't, we hope to get a decrease in sea loss, but we don't see that. So here's the amount of sea loss that we see when we don't have virus. And here's the amount we do when we see how virus. So this is just from the interaction. Now here's another virus. Uh, this virus is very common and we did not expect that this virus would have a negative impact on sea loss and it doesn't. Um, here's, and, and apparently our data show that this virus and sea loss are, we don't see effects on either of them having any effect on the other. So here we're looking at virus titer uh, this, so the height of the bar is the amount of virus in uninfected or in psyllids that don't have sea loss and those that do. And then here we're looking at the amount of sea loss in those that have the virus uh, and those that don't. So just from a pure competition point, we don't see a negative impact so far. But remember, that's only two of the five viruses that we're working at. And these experiments take a little bit of time. They're quite tedious. We have to keep all these cages like this. Um, and we know for this particular virus that when it infects D. citri, we can still get transmission of C. loss to citrus. <clears throat> okay, so maybe we can make viruses better. That is to do some things that we want them to do for us. And one of the strategies that we've been interested in is using what's called RNA interference. Now, this is a natural gene regulation strategy. You have it, I have it, every eukaryotic organism has it. And what happens is RNA gets recognized by this surveillance, RNA interference surveillance system and gets degraded. And so if this RNA, and since we're all read about mRNA and COVID and everything right now, I, you know exactly what RNAs are doing. So if an RNA is degraded, that means that the protein that it would give rise to in the cell is not going to be there. So our idea and many other people, uh, including some collaborators that I'll mention in just a minute, is can we use viruses and induce RNA I effects? Now this happens to represent an aphid, but um, the idea would be towards psyllids and there's two different approaches. One would be, can we use viruses and introduce them into a plant cell to get an RNA interference response when the insect feeds on the plant, it would, it, the indirect RNA effects would target the uh, insect. But the other approach is actually targeting the insect itself for the virus that I'll get to. So I got ahead of myself here, but 
we can use plant viruses and in, in induce RNAi effects in insects. And this is some work that um, <clears throat> the scientists in our lab had done. And here we were targeting the citrus mealy bug. And what we did here was just engineer a plant virus and we infected plants and the plant virus was engineered to target specific genes in the mealybug, not in the plant. And what happens here is here's uh, the mealybugs when they reproduce on the plant that's infected with a control virus. But here's the mealybugs after the eggs hatch and the nymphs begin to develop on uh, plants that are infected with the recombinant virus. And so we can kill them. So people like our colleagues and others in Florida uh, from Bill Dawson's lab and others are attempting to use that similar strategy in citrus using plant viruses to infect plants and induce RNAi effects. Our lab, we're taking this approach where we want to use the psyllid virus to infect the psyllid and induce RNAi effects. And our goal is actually not to kill the psyllids, but to modify the psyllids. So here, okay, I don't know why this, just a second. Here, what we've done, and this is uh, Emily Matsumura, we've used a virus and we've been able to infect Asian citrus psyllids with this virus. And this is called cricket paralysis virus. And this virus, well, it kills psyllids. Um, and it makes them paralytic. And you can see here that they're paralyzed and they don't move. So this, this virus is, we've used this one because it's such a, it's a good virus to use in the lab. So what we've, we do is we have this virus, we can genetically modify it, and we want to use it to try and target uh, D. citri, but not to kill D. citri. And unfortunately, the wild type virus, it does kill DC3. And so this shows the amount of virus that we get versus uh, healthy ones. And by this stage, by about six days, they start dying. Whoops. So what uh, Dr. Metz, Professor Metzmer, now what she has done is she's made this virus so that it's not so lethal to uh, psyllids. And here you can see the modified virus and days post-injection and survival. Here's the wild type virus. And so here we can get a significant percentage of the psyllids that don't die. And we've been able to engineer the virus. We can actually insert sequences into the virus here and we can infect the psyllids. And then we can, we're attempting now to, indu to use these inserted sequences to induce specific effects by targeting psyllid RNAs by RNA interference. And so we've been able to genetically modify the cricket paralysis virus and the modified virus works very well, okay? The modified virus induces an antiviral response and actually induces a specific RNAi response. So if we insert, in this case, we inserted uh, a sequence that was sort of irrelevant to the, to the psyllid, we can insert it into this uh, virus genome here. We can infect the psyllids, and then we can actually look here with molecular biological approaches to see if we're seeing an effect. And we, we can, because we see these specific RNA molecules here. And we can, we have been able to go in and measure and show that we actually are knocking down the expression of the specific RNA, RNA that we want to target. And so what we need, need to do is, is to find the correct RNAs that we can then target and modify the psyllid. Our goal is not to kill the psyllid. We know that um, if we want to kill the psyllid with the virus, evolution happens, and we're going to end up with psyllids that are going to be resistant to our viruses. What we would like to do is to modify uh, the psyllid and make it so that it's really not a competent vector. And we would like to use uh, viruses that we can then 
theoret in the long term spread among the psyllid population. So our idea is using our viruses. So we're working with all of these viruses, <clears throat> and we have some good success with a couple of them. This one has been difficult, I said, as I said, because it really is limited in its host range. Uh, this one is not limited in its host range so far in that we've been able to infect all the psyllids that we've tested with this virus. And we don't see a negative effect and we're attempting to modify this virus now. And uh, this virus it is also a good virus because this virus is spread not only uh, vertically from infected females, but, but also spread horizontally in the population. So by from one psyllid to another, this one, is more difficult for us to use because this virus is only spread vertically from infected females to uh, the progeny. So our ongoing work, and that includes people now in my lab, but two people who have also gone on uh, to their own assistant professor positions, three people who have gone on to their own assistant professor positions, we're still collaborating and we're attempting to use these viruses in a way that will allow us to confer some traits uh, on Decitri that might be able to modify it so that it's really not a good vector. So viruses are not all bad. We know that Decitri is full of viruses. I mean, if you look at any Decitri out there, it's going to have viruses in it. And not all Decitri have the same viruses for sure. So what are the goals of these viruses? We, we know that microbes in any individual are communicating and we would like to know how this communication is working and can we find some natural viruses that can affect the communication in the decitri C loss virus interaction and affect decitri. But we would also think that we can take new approaches and modify viruses to make them better. So that's the end of my talk. Okay, so we do have a question in the chat. Um, do the DCDV resistant ACP populations from California and Hawaii have DCDV sequence in their genomes? This would suggest a potential mechanism for RNAi mediated resistance. That's a very good question. And yes, they do. And We've been looking, it's really been such an interesting project scientifically because as we look at these sequences, we find all these virus sequences that are integrated into D. citri. And these are evolutionary remnants of past virus infections. And so if you remember that slide, I showed you two haplotypes A and B, and I don't remember which is A and which is B right now. I think A was, the Taiwan and Uruguay, and those are susceptible, and they do not have that sequence in their genome. But the B haplotypes of California and Hawaii, uh, they do have this DCDV small sequence in their genome. And in fact, they make specific small RNAs um, in their cells that are called uh, Kiwi interacting RNAs. So this is very interesting from the fundamental side. We have so much to learn before we can really take this to a, a practical level, but it's just potential is so great. Okay, so I think that's all the questions for now, at least until the end of the, at least until the panel discussion. Uh, so I'm gonna switch to our next speaker. Our third and final speaker is Dr. Bryony Bonning. Dr. Bonning is an eminent scholar and professor in the Department of Entomology and Nematology at the University of Florida, and is also the director of the Center for Arthropod Management. Today, she will be talking about managing Asian citrus psyllid with pesticidal proteins from bacteria. Dr. Bonning, you can go in ahead and share your slides. Okay, um, thank you very much for the introduction. And so today, under the heading of uh, Emerging Technologies for Management of ACP and HLB. Um, I'll be talking specifically about bacterial pesticidal proteins. And the previous two speakers have provided an excellent introduction for various aspects of this talk. 
So we've already learned about the Asian citrus psyllid. Um, this insect was first detected in Florida in 1998. And as it feeds on citrus, it was considered a pest and could reduce yields, um, but it didn't really gain the significant importance until the arrival of the CLAS pathogenic bacterium, so Candidatus liberobacter asiaticus, which was first detected in Florida in 2005. And as you're likely aware, uh, this pathogen has decimated citrus pr production in Florida. The thing about this tritrophic interaction, the insect vectors transmission of the pa pathogenic bacterium is the efficiency of the system. So if the psyllid feeds on an infected citrus plant, it only takes 15 to 30 minutes for that psyllid to acquire the pathogenic bacterium. And then once infected, if that infected psyllid visits um, a healthy plant, just after an hour of feeding, the pathogen will have been released into the plant host. So this part of the challenge with managing this disease is the efficiency of the transmission of the pathogen by Asian citrus psyllid. So then clearly targeting the Asian citrus psyllid is a logical approach to try to disrupt the transmission of CLAS. Uh, in citrus. And of course, the initial response was the widespread application of classical chemical insecticides. And in Florida, we were up to 14 or so treatments per season. And as has been shown over and over, if you hit an insect repeatedly uh, with the same mode of action, you will rapidly uh, develop insecticide resistance. And so these insecticides have become less effective with time. So what other approaches do we have? Because for this insect, uh, we don't find any natural resistance um, in citrus against Asian citrus psyllid at the present time. So alternative approaches, there are several. Um, they include the use of pesticidal proteins that target the gut of the insect, for example, from BT, and I'll come back to this shortly. Um, as uh, Dr. Fork mentioned, the silencing of genes in the insect, so genes that might be essential for survival, and this is uh, by means of a mechanism called the RNA interference. There's also the potential to use biological control. Viruses are listed as an example, but perhaps not such a great example. Um, but parasitoids, uh, there are a few candidates there. Um, and then finally, uh, things such as attractants, pheromones, repellents, um, and trapping. And what I'll be focusing on today are these two, the use of pesticidal proteins that target the insect gut. And I'll also be mentioning the silencing of genes that are essential for insect survival. So both of these strategies, uh, they are delivered to the insect gut. And the combination of these two works very much better than the individual strategies. We know this in part uh, because of methods used for management of other insect pests in agriculture, for example, management of Western corn rootworm uh, in the Midwest. They've all clearly shown that uh, pesticidal proteins plus silencing RNAs uh, work better in combination. So Bacillus thuringiensis, which you may know um, as BT, um, this has been a very useful tool for management of a variety of insect pests of both agricultural and medical human health importance. So Bacillus thuringiensis is a spore forming bacteria that's found in the soil. And during the process of producing spores, this bacterium also produces pesticidal proteins. So if you look at this image on the right hand side, you'll see these oval spores. There's two separate bacteria shown here with the oval shaped spores and then this bipyramidal crystal. So this crystal structure, which is massive in terms of the size of the bacterium, is made up of pesticidal proteins. And importantly, different strains of Bt, which have been isolated from different places around the world, have different combinations of pesticidal proteins. 
So this bacterium itself has been widely used for organic agriculture and also for the control of mosquitoes and other disease vectors, which you can target at the larval stages. But in addition to using the whole bacterium, the pesticidal proteins themselves have also been successfully uh, exploited for insect pest control. And in particular, um, transgenic crops that have, uh, have been engineered to suppress damaging insect populations. Uh, the majority of corn, uh, maize, and also cotton in the United States um, expresses uh, Bt proteins. And importantly, these proteins are not toxic to humans or non-target organisms. So they, the bacterium itself and also the, some of these individual pesticidal proteins have a very good track record in terms of safety and efficacy. So in considering whether we can take this really useful tool and apply it for suppression of the Asian citrus psyllid populations, the first thing we have to do is to identify pesticidal proteins that are active against the Asian citrus psyllid. Each of these proteins uh, has a certain number of insects or a certain type of insects um, that it can be used effectively against. So for this very first step, we collaborate with Dr. Michael Blackburn at the USDA ARS in Maryland. And the facility there, they have about 4,000 different strains of BT available for testing. And so what we have done is prepare mixtures of pesticidal proteins from a number of these different strains and conducted bioassays with Asian citrus psyllid to find out if any of the mixtures will kill the psyllids. So this is 500 micrograms of the protein mixture. This is a very high dose. Um, and we have, so percentage mortality on the y-axis against days in the bioassay. And you can see that with time, we have significant mortality resulting from feeding the psyllids on these protein mixtures compared to the diet and the buffer only controls. So each of these strains, there's something in their protein mixtures that is active against the Asian citrus psyllid. So the next step is to identify which particular protein is active from these mixtures. And what you'll see here are, these are gels for three different pesticidal proteins, Cry1AB, Cry1BA, and MPP51AA1. And what we have here is the solubilized protein, pesticidal protein, and the activated. So some of these pesticidal proteins require proteolytic digestion before they are active. So you'll see this change in size uh, following trypsin activation for Cry1AB and Cry1BA. In the case of MPP51, which is a different type of pesticidal protein, an ETX, MTX type protein, there is no change. Um, and this particular protein does not need activation. And here we can see the mortality on day five, uh, the buffer control compared to the pesticidal protein at a lower dose, 100 micrograms per mil in this case. Now, for any of you who are familiar with BT proteins, you may not recognize this name, MPP51AA1. And I would encourage you, or also if you're interested in bacterial pesticidal proteins, to visit this new site, the Bacterial Pesticidal Protein Resource Center, bppr.c.org, and also uh, a paper that came out from Neil Crickmore last year, a structure-based nomenclature for Bacillus thuringiensis and other bacteria-derived pesticidal proteins. So another thing that we looked at from this work was to find out whether these individual pesticidal proteins were behaving as we expected them to. These proteins bind to the insect gut. They create a pore and basically uh, disrupt the lining or the epithelium of the gut. 
What we have on the left here is a scanning electron micrograph of the surface of a typical insect gut. So these are microvilli, they look like spaghetti. They have a very high surface area for absorption of nutrients from the gut lumen. And this is a, similarly, this is a psyllid gut in this case. And this is in transverse section. So it's a transmission electron micrograph with the epithelial cell here, the gut lumen there, and here are the microvilli. These are the guts from insects. This one was fed on a protein mixture from a BT strain. And you can see the damaged microvilli here. Here's the gut lumen. And this is the result of damage caused by Cry1BA. So really major damage. So you can see that this is very consistent with what you would expect one of these pesticidal proteins to do to an insect. When we look at the efficacy, we determine the lethal concentration that kills 50% or the LC50. And for adult ACP on day five, for Cry1AB and Cry1BA, the LC50 is between 115 and 130. Um, this is a great starting point, but further optimization would be good if we were going to use this um, for practical use in the field. So the second objective is to having identified proteins that have activity against the Asian citrus psyllid is to actually optimize, increase the efficacy. And what we're doing here is following um, work done by Nana Chowgali et al. It was published in PNAS in 2013, showing that the addition of a peptide anchor to a pesticidal protein can increase the toxicity against um, an insect. So to explain how this works, we have a schematic here um, on the left. So the lower area is the gut epithelial cell and the upper area is the gut lumen. And here we have BT proteins in the gut. And these may not bind to the gut surface at all or bind only very weakly. What we do is isolate a gut binding peptide or GBP. And these peptides are selected because they bind specifically and tightly to proteins on the surface of the gut epithelium. If you then add these peptides to a BT pesticidal protein, you provide an artificial anchor. The proteins bind uh, better to the surface of the epithelium, resulting in poor formation, gut damage, and death of your target insect, and in this case, the Asian citrus psyllid. So having identified pesticidal proteins, optimized efficacy, we have the question of delivery. And uh, Dr. Michelle Heck um, addressed this very nicely. The Asian citrus psyllid feeds on the plant sap and specifically the phloem. And so in order to use this in the field, we have to get our pesticidal proteins into the phloem. So the first approach is to modify plants to express the proteins in the phloem. And you'll immediately think, oh, transgenic citrus. And yes, that is an option, but there is a second option. And the second option is to use so-called trap plants. So a trap plant, the concept is that you have a plant that is more attractive to your insect, Asian citrus psyllid, than your crop plant. So the trap plants that we have been working with, uh, it's uh, Indian curry leaf plant. Uh, these plants continuously flush or produce bright new green leaves, and these are super attractive to psyllids. So if we had transgenic trap plants that were planted within or around the grove, the concept is that the Asian citrus psyllids that uh, fly in would be attracted to these plants, would land, would feed, ingest the bacterial pesticidal protein and die as a result of that before they even made it into the citrus grove. So here uh, to illustrate that we have our transgenic plants, either citrus or the trap plant engineered to produce the Bt pesticidal protein that goes into the sap is ingested by the psyllid resulting in psyllid mortality. 
So that's one idea. But the second idea is to modify naturally occurring viruses or microbes that reside in the phloem to deliver the pesticidal protein. And the first of these is a citrus tristeza virus, which Dr. Fork has mentioned. This virus resides in the phloem, so it's in the perfect position to deliver a pesticidal protein. In addition to this plant virus, uh, citrus trisea virus is not particularly pathogenic. And so you're using it as a delivery system uh, without compounding the problems for the plant. The second option is to use bacteria that reside in the sap. There are more bacteria in the xylem of uh, the plant than in the phloem. Uh, but this is a second approach uh, that we have been working on. So we have advanced on the broad front and been working on all of these different strategies. So Dr. Vladimir Orbovich has uh, led the effort for the production of the transgenic plants, both citrus and the Indian curry leaf trap plant. Uh, Bill Dawson's group has been working with the citrus tristeza virus. And then doctors Caroline Roper and James Borneman at UC Riverside have been working on the phloem inhabiting bacteria uh, to produce a delivery system for agents to go into the phloem. So to summarize, uh, we have identified multiple pesticidal proteins derived from bacteria that are active against Asian citrus psyllid and optimization of those proteins for increased efficacy is underway by addition of gut binding peptides. Transgenic citrus and trap plants expressing pesticidal proteins are effective for suppression of ACP under greenhouse conditions. Um, CTV also shows promise and our bacterial delivery system is in its early stages of development. But I would say also that different delivery systems are going to be useful for different pesticidal proteins. For example, the smaller pesticidal proteins uh, work much better in the CTV delivery system uh, because that vector tends to be unstable if the insert size is too large. So it won't be one size fits all. An important thing uh, to note is the bacterial pesticidal proteins hold great promise. They are not a silver bullet. And we know from experience in other pest management systems that you do have to use an integrated pest management approach for effective, sustainable management of any insect pest. So learning again from the Western Coral Rootworm example, we are now uh, looking at the combination of BT derived pesticidal proteins and gene silencing RNAs. And this was recently funded by the USDA. But for management of the, the disease, management of citrus greening, I anticipate that we will need not only different modes of action to target the Asian citrus psyllid, but also strategies to target the sea last bacterium itself. So antimicrobial peptides, for example, as uh, discussed by uh, Dr. Heck. So looking to the future, uh, we will continue to work on the different delivery methods for the bacterial pesticidal proteins for psyllid control We'll be assessing the efficacy of different proteins in different systems, um, familiarizing the public with this new approach, and also addressing the regulatory requirements, um, which will be needed before growers will actually be able to use the technology in the field. So finally, I'd like to just acknowledge some of the people who have been involved in this USDA project. Um, the BT pesticidal protein isolation and optimization. Uh, was, the work was done by Dr. Pavan Kumar and Mariah Kamara. The transgenic plant delivery uh, by Dr. Sayed Ali Rafanfar in Dr. Vladimir Orbovich's group. The CTV delivery in uh, Dr. Shoa El Motar in Bill Dawson's group. 
And then the in-plant bioassays were conducted by Freddy Ibanez, who was in Dr. Lucas Zielinski's lab at University of Florida and now has his own lab at Texas A&M. And of course, USDA funding. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. We do have a few questions before we move on to our panel. Um, one asks, um, so would you want to interplant curry plant within the citrus to trap the insects? So my understanding of this is that the best strategy for use of trap plants is to, tra to plant the traps around the edges of the grove before the psyllids even get into the grove. Uh, I believe there has been some work done on this uh, by a group in Brazil, but it, this would need uh, additional in-field testing to establish the best use of these trap plants. Excellent, thank you. And then Carla asked, if we are using BT engineered viruses or bacteria, would it classify as a transgenic crop? So if we are delivering our pesticidal protein using viruses or bacteria, it's not a transgenic crop because it's the microbe that you're using to deliver. So that has a different classification um, and different risk assessment considerations. Okay. And then we also have a question that says, which sap does the ACP preferably ingest, phloem or xylem? So this is a good question. So the insects, the Asian citrus psyllid, it hydrate on the xylem and then feed on the phloem. So the adult psyllids spend more time hydrating on xylem than the nymphs do. Um, so we are definitely targeting the phloem, but there is potentially the case. Uh, so with our bacterial delivery system, for example, I mentioned there are more bacteria that uh, reside in the xylem of the plant than in the phloem. Uh, so there is potentially the case where you could use uh, a xylem residing bacterium for delivery of agents that would actually be ingested by the psyllid. But to guarantee the highest dose, our strategy is to target the phloem. Okay, thank you. I think that is the last question specific to your presentation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the entire panel to answer the remaining questions. Um, the first question, have there been any studies showing the impacts on the edibles in relation to human consumption. And I think this is referring to the peptides from Dr. Heck's presentation. I might be wrong about that, but I'm not sure. Yes, that is true. Yep, thanks, sure. That research is currently being evaluated right now. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, there's also a question that asks, is, a, is resistance to the BT peptides an issue? And the answer is yes, this always is a major consideration, whether you're using BT derived pesticidal proteins or gene silencing RNAs. If you, if you use a given mode of action repeatedly against an insect population, that population will eventually develop resistance. Uh, it's also been shown even for viruses that have co-evolved with the insects over the millennia. Uh, that you will get resistance. So what we do know though, is that if you use multiple modes of action, so combining the pesticidal protein with gene silencing um, and potentially other modes of action as well, you increase the amount of time that you can use that tool, uh, you delay the onset of resistance. It becomes more difficult for the targeted pest to develop resistance when you have multiple modes of action. All right, thank you. And then there's also a question that, that says, uh, it, it is, any, is any technology available right now for the growers to control HLB? Must not be, no one's saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think in, um, you know, it depends on where you are in California or Florida. 
So um, if you're a grower in California, your best defense right now is um, intensive monitoring of your groves for signs of the psyllid um, and you know testing your trees by PCR, uh, investigating some early detection, indirect detection methods um, that have been shown to be useful to help maybe targeted management of, of certain regions of your grove. Um, you know, if you're in Florida, I think the situation is a little bit different and you're trying to keep these trees productive in the face of heavy disease pressure. And so the available options there are, are you know, are quite different and involve the use of um, therapeutic treatment of the trees with antibiotics, for example. Um, so it, it really depends on the, the growing region. I think also, <clears throat> and I'm not an expert, but in like when I was in Brazil and then also in Florida, that the agriculture, it, it, we have to change, you know, we have to change. We can't just grow the trees the way they used to be grown now that we have the, the psyllids and the pathogen there. And so more dense planting, uh, really looking and making sure that, yes, you don't have infected trees, rapid removal of infected trees. So it's not like it used to be. And so you can grow uh, citrus, yes, but we just have to be more proactive really in taking precautions to not let it get out of control. The insects are really the sentinels. And so, you know, you want to be actively monitoring your traps and, and scouting for the Asian citrus psyllid. Look for the signs of uh, Asian citrus psyllid infestation. Um, know what their feeding damage looks like, how to recognize their honeydew, their life stages, and so on. Um, this way you can, you can try to mitigate any insect spread in your region. Certainly the growers in Florida have become very good at nurturing infected trees to get the most out of them. But I would say also that although there is no technology, as it were, um, available right now, I think things look very bright based on the technologies even that have been presented today for future use. Uh, it's going to take some time to get these to the field, but uh, I expect we'll be in a very much better position in five or 10 years time. I think you're right. And I think maybe I'm just old and grumpy and complain like this, but if, if you look at what's been done with COVID, okay, and how quickly it's been done, that's because that's uh, really a phenomenal success in terms of getting vaccines and therapeutics, but there's also been bajillions of dollars and scientists involved. And, in plants, we've had to work hard to get money for fundamental research to allow us to take translational approaches. And so I think the future is good if we can it, you just have the, the infrastructure and the funding to do it. Yes, and the complexities of this system, the efficiency of the transmission, the fact that we actually can't yet effectively culture the bacterium, the CLAS bacterium, there's some really big challenges, but uh, yes. I think what's exciting too, in terms of the research front is that we have different groups working on both different types of therapeutics and different delivery strategies that can ultimately be, you know, mixed and matched in a variety of different ways to provide, um, you know, different levels of protection, different types of treatment and so on um, that would provide that this sort of toolbox approach rather than a, you know, magic bullet. For sure. And you both said, I mean, we can't have one approach. I mean, we've got to really learn all of these different opportunities and, and take advantage of them. Um, so we don't have very many more questions. Uh, we do have one that says, is antibiotic injection really effective for promoting fruit production in the Florida groves? I have not seen uh, the data on this, but it certainly doesn't seem to be particularly practical. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you want to comment on that, uh, Michelle. No, I haven't. I haven't seen the data on that either. Uh, but I do know the company. You know, we're working with AgriSource has been one of the leaders in the development of the antibiotic treatments, and um, so you know, anyone who would like to find out the specific information on the data that they have from their field trials, 
um, I can certainly get you in touch with them if you reach out to me, my email address. Okay. I just wanted to mention something to uh, Dr. Bonning and uh, we've done some experiments re uh, rearing psyllids on curry leaf and then, um, you know, sort of looking at the their transmission characteristics. And, uh, you know, curry leaf is very interesting because you actually don't get the robust development of a systemic infection with CLAS in that plant. And um, as it turns out, when, um, you know, you rear insects, infected insect populations on these plants, the titer of the bacteria goes down and uh, in the insects. And so, um, you know, through the generations, they actually become less and less competent to transmit. And so it's a, I just wanted to mention that it's a very good choice of the, um, the decoy crop uh, plant to use because any survivors would also ultimately be less competent to transmit the CLAS bacterium into the, into the field. Yes, and I failed to mention that in the presentation. So not only is it more attractive, but also it doesn't support uh, the CLAS bacterium. So yes, you definitely wouldn't want to use something that would allow the bacterium to proliferate anywhere near the groves. So thank you for that addition. <laughs> I had a question regarding the, the, the choice of that plant. Um, because it's flushing all the time, um, you know, you would expect to get lots of insect reproduction and egg lay and so on. And so do you find, you know, ha do you have data yet on the, you know, um, fitness of the insects on the, the transgenic plants expressing the, the toxins um, to show that the, you know, the kill rate is higher than, you know, the increased re uh, rate of reproduction due to all the flush tissue available for those females to lay eggs? Yes, the kill rate is very good. Um, the, with the pesticidal proteins, they, the mortality data is higher when the plants are flushing. So presumably reflecting the fact that this is what the cell is like to feed on. Um, and for Indian curry, the kill rate is very good. So that would not be a problem. We wouldn't be supporting popula populations of new cellars at all. Yeah, that's really um, cool. And I did also show data for um, bioassay data for adults, um, but we do know that these, these proteins uh, are more effective against the nymphs than the adults, which is what you would expect based on similar agents being used in other insect systems. And that's so. actually very important uh, because the spread of this bacterium is linked to the insect development, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of its life cycle. And so killing those nymphs really puts an end to the transmission chain because the, the insects have to acquire the bacterium as nymphs for them to become competent to transmit as adults. That's right, yes. Okay. And then we have another question that came in that says, what about compost teas and ACP? Has any work been done on that? There was a paper published recently out of the University of Florida with collaborators at the USDA ARS in Fort Pierce that showed um, extracts from oak leaves has a suppressive effect on the bacterium. Um, and uh, I can I can try to put a link to that paper up in the chat if anyone wants to see it. Other than that, I'm not aware of any work done on that in that area. Okay. And Irene asked in the chat, um, is there any other insect that would transmit the disease? I believe the disease is referring to HLB. Yes, there's um, the African psyllid, but it's not found in North America. And so, uh, the, so the African psyllid experimentally can transmit CLAS, but since the geographic distribution of CLAS and the African psyllid don't overlap, it's not considered a vector of concern. And this insect is not found in the United States or North America. Okay. And then we have a question that says, when using plant viruses to induce RNA into plant feeding insects, is it possible the, vir the plant viruses could change over time and not affect the insects or do plant viruses remain the same? Just like COVID, no, no, it, it, yes, they will change. And uh, I mean, viruses are changing all the time and that is a problem with any virus. Uh, so far, you start modifying it and uh, you know, I mean, they are the way they are because they're successful and we try and make them better, but uh, can work for a while, but they'll, they tend to lose their inserts, just like 
um, Professor Bonning mentioned with BT, you know, big inserts, they, they get rid of them over time. Okay, um, I guess we will end there. Thank you so much to all of you for speaking. And thank you to, for, uh, to everyone that has attended today and enjoy the rest of your day.